Now let us take a shot from the word of God. I have seen the time. I don't intend to keep you for too long. But we need to, uh, the morning session is to build, to build capacity in line with the subject of emphasis as we travel through the word of God. So you may wish to turn your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter number 16. There is a statement that Jesus made in uh, Matthew chapter 16, beginning from verse 17. I'd like us to take inventory of the statement. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon but Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus spoke about the gates of hell. He did not say that if the gate of hell will make attempts, he said the gate of hell will actually show up but the guarantee that we have is that the gate of hell will not prevail. What is the meaning of this? And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, if you still remember Pastor Dan's definition of witchcraft, Witchcraft has wide spectrum of definitions, but basically it is illegitimate authority. Someone trying to exercise authority, someone trying to exercise control, someone trying to register dominion over your life illegitimately, that's what witchcraft is. So when we talk about witchcraft, the key word authority is central to the understanding of witchcraft. Witchcraft is an attempt to exercise illegitimate what? Authority. So what is authority? We need some people from the congregation to help us with a working definition of what authority is so that we can relate with the possibility of illegitimate authority. So, um, maybe the ushers will grab a microphone and then we'll take it around. I need feedback from the congregation. What exactly is authority? Authority. Who is coming to the rescue? So, ushers, you don't necessarily need to give someone that is raising his hand the mic, just anyone you like. <laughs> what, what exactly? Give, give a lady, give a lady. No, give. Start with a sister. Any sister that is within range. Yeah, so, sister, what is authority? Because a perfect understanding of what authority is will lend us possibilities to enter into the understanding of what witchcraft is. Because witchcraft wants to exercise illegitimate authority on your life. So what's authority? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. To my own little understanding, authority is exercising power over a thing. Exercising or, power over a thing? Yeah. Yes. True. So you have 70% on your definition. So we will use her definition as a working definition. It's quite simple, easy for you to understand. Exercising power over a thing. Maybe you want to, you want to um, go to school, you want to earn a degree, and then someone exercises power over you, contrary to your will. And the power that is exercised over you eventually truncates your ambition, it truncates your possibility, it truncates and measures the actualization of your potential. When you find that, witchcraft is at work. It's not an authority you recognize. 
is an, not an authority that you submitted to, but the authority nonetheless is effective in your space in spite of the fact that there was never a time that you gave it the right to influence your life. It is illegitimate, but yet it is authority nonetheless. Are you still with me? Oh, you're not here again. You know what you do when you're not with me is that I reduce the ration. Maybe we'll just keep the ration low at the basic minimum level. And then when your appetite for much more spiritual food grows, we can top up the ration. So I don't want to be that pastor that will give you more food than you have capacity to receive because most of it is going to be wasted. So we'll stay with the ration. Are you still with me? Yes, now, as simple as the definition that our sister gave is, if you look around you, you will find out how universal witchcraft is. Don't go too far. Look at your family. If by any means your family has not actualized the fullness of what people are endowed with, the possibilities of their endowments, and there seem to be some shortfall in actualization. It's a pointer to the fact they are controlling powers, they are authorities, though illegitimate, that are responsible to a great extent. We understand that lack of discipline and a lot of things work together to limit a man's potential. But I'm talking about people that are disciplined, people that are doing all the right things, but yet they are still under some form of measured passage. It's an indication of the fact that witchcraft is involved. And the reason why I chose this scripture, there are so many scriptures about witchcraft in the Bible. In fact, I was trying to do some study on blessing and cursing and I found that all through scripture, there's so much on blessing and cursing in the Bible. I didn't expect to see it in that volume. If something is in the Bible in a certain kind of volume, it is suggestive of the fact that it should be in our messages in the same measure or volume. So I'm trying to check the full spirit of emphasis that is in the Bible. That's my current body so that my messages can be reflective of the emphasis of God. And I found out that most of the things that we emphasize is not consistent with the emphasis of the kingdom of God. If I take you to the book of Matthew, you will see there were three fundamental things that Jesus said that were majors, majors. He was rebuking the Pharisees. He was rebuking the scribes. And he said that the Pharisees and the scribes taught the people how to tithe cumin, anise, and mint. Are you with me? You know what cumin is? You know what anise are? Spices, vegetables, and pepper. They are so taught tight that they even gave the application of tithing in vegetable, in spices, and in pepper. But Jesus rebuked them. <laughs> you are not with me. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus rebuked them and said they have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Jesus did not. And Jesus balanced it and said, you guys were supposed to teach about tithe. You are doing a great job there. But you are not supposed to omit the order. So our teaching and preaching is supposed to reflect um, the gravity of emphasis in each case. So that majors can be held up as majors. And electives can be held, us, held up as electives. What the teachers of those days did was that they majored in electives and left the majors. So there was a fracture in their teaching ministry. And the hope that God had in building the people was truncated by their emphasis. Are you still with me? So I'm trying in current times to flip through scriptures and to find um, the issues of gravity so that I can afflict you with the word of God. Amen. Amen. Now, so when we talk about authority, our sister says, it is a power that is exerted to influence. So, 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 my question is, 
the moment Jesus spoke about the church, because you need to know the background of the scripture that we just read. The last time Jesus spoke, before he, he's speaking this thing, the last time they were in Western Israel, and after the crusade they had there, Jesus didn't speak again until they came to Eastern Israel. Because he had something in mind he wanted to disclose, but he wanted them to be in a certain location that will make it easy for him to point to examples within that location about the matter that he has in heart. And if you check this scripture critically, the, the golden issue that was locked up in the heart of Jesus that Jesus could not speak about until they arrived Caesarea Philippi was the issue concerning the church. That city called Caesarea eventually had a governor that was Philip the Tetrarch. And Philip the Tetrarch was a civil engineer. So when he was made governor of Caesarea, what he did was that he began to reconstruct the entire, the entire city to give the city a facelift. He began to build roads. He began to knock off some several buildings that will deface the terrain. There was a lot of painting that was going on, a lot of reconstruction that was going on. You'll find iron rods everywhere. And so Jesus kept quiet until he came to Caesarea. Everything was speaking building. There were blocks. There were rods. There were cement bags. Do you understand? Tippers bringing sand. Everything was speaking building. That was when he now said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Well, when they gathered all the answers that came from the responses outside of the camp, they were not suggestive of the fact that they had really captured the essence of Jesus' existence and his ministry. So he rephrased the sample space of the questionnaire that he was administering, and he said, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now you know the story and how Peter came up and brought a revelation. So we now discovered the reason why Jesus was administering the questionnaires in the first place. In his intercourse with his father early that morning, the father had revealed to him that there was somebody out there that he had disclosed his identity to. So Jesus said, don't worry, I have my way of uh, finding out who the person is. And that was the reason why he administered the questionnaire and found out that the person was not out there. So he paraphrased and changed the scope of the administration of the questionnaire and found out that it was Peter that the father has spoken to. And what was it that Peter revealed about Jesus? Are you still there? There were two things that Peter revealed about Jesus and we can see that in uh, verse number 16. Stay with me. Stay with me. It's my duty to teach you the scripture so that each and every one of us will become giants in the spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And those of you that are listening online, you are part of what God is doing. It is my duty to teach you the scriptures. The Lord had prepared me for this season for many years. He took away 10 years of my life and he forced me to dedicate it to Bible study. It's not as if if you decide today to stand up and to study the Bible for 10 years, it's not as if you are likely to find anything. The reason why I found was because it was him that instructed me to do it. <laughs> because it is spiritual things, it's not by power, not by might, it's by the Spirit of God. So he was there with me in 10 years of adventure in the scriptures and he opened my eyes to a few things. Uh, these few things in the which he opened my eyes, I am determined to begin to unveil them during the course of 2022. All right, this was the revelation that Peter gave. In verse 16 he said, and Simon, Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Son of the living God. There were two parts to the disclosure. The first part of the disclosure was about his office. And that office is of an office in the spirit. An office that he was assigned when he returned from accomplishing the work of redemption and from satisfying the claims of divine justice 
he was admitted into an office in the spirit. Now I need to show you this office that Peter was talking about because the Bible says that in the book of Hebrews that we should come boldly unto the throne of grace. Now I just use that scripture to reveal to you that grace is managed, grace is administered from a throne in the spirit. And it happens to be that that throne in the spirit is the office that Jesus occupies. One of the tributaries of life that is dispensed from that throne is grace. And I know you are aware of the fact that you cannot live the Christian life if you do not have grace. You will hear testimonies from men like Paul that having received the grace of God, I have continued unto this day. But the Christian life is a supernatural life. The expectations that God has concerning us and the hopes that heaven enjoys that we will fulfill can only be achieved by the energy called grace. And grace itself is managed by a throne. There's an administration that is set up around the release and the workings of grace. That is the throne that Jesus occupies in the realm of the spirit. And, and Peter was disclosing the fact that he had an office in the spirit. You are the one ordained to be the Christ. You are the son of the living God. I'll explain the second aspect of his confession. But you need to know that he has an office in the spirit. And if you're a diligent Bible study, you'll find that there was vacancy in Zion according to the book of Isaiah. Because Isaiah was telling a prophetic tale of how Lucifer fell from heaven. And the tale that Isaiah told in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, was how Lucifer coveted that vacant throne in Zion. It was because he coveted a throne that was not assigned to him, was not his ordination or destiny in God, that was why he fell. And it is the same throne that was eventually assigned to Jesus. It is the occupation of that throne that has made him the author. The author. Anything that has to do with life, anything that has to do with the regime of life, he happens to be the one that has been set up as the administrator of all the processes of life. You see, your entrance into the kingdom, for instance, was incumbent, was dependent, was occasioned by your, your uh, um, entrance into a realm of life a realm of life, the realm of the Zoe, you had to become a, a participator in this Zoe life in order for you to have access to the realities that are obtainable in the kingdom of God. Uh, this Zoe life, your entrance into Zoe life, for instance, was on the basis of your believing in Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, and it is from his throne from his administration that your life in God is managed. It is because of the ministry that Jesus right now sustains on that throne that you are, you are kept a believer. Huh? He ministers grace into your spirit man from that administrative position. And the Bible is saying there is so much abundance of grace that is available in the realm of the spirit, if only we can come boldly to the throne of grace. As abundant as grace is, grace is not available to you except you come for it. Are you there? As abundant as salvation is, you know, it's salvation, Jesus paid the price, not everyone is saved. Why? It didn't just happen automatic. There is something that had to be done in order for them to tap into what is already available. Are you with me? You're following me? Do you realize that the average Christian, when it comes to issues of deliverance, issues of curses, the average Christian quotes this scripture, if any man be in Christ, a new creation, all things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new, as though there is anything in God that is in God that automatically becomes yours. Salvation, Jesus paid for it. It was available for all of mankind. Jesus did not die for the church. He died for the whole world. Oh, you're not with me. But not everybody is saved. If any man be in Christ, a new creation, that's true. 
all things are passed. It's because of that which changed. It's because you are a new creation. That's why you have a basis to even fight the curse. That's why you have a basis, you have a right to deliverance, just in case the devil is violating your space. It, the, the, your, your being a new creation is a launching pad with which you need to take authority and begin to labor for the, um, what do you call it in law again? You receive a judgment in court in order for the, to enforce the position of heaven. Nothing happens to you in an automatic way. It is enforced. You know, because the average believer doesn't like walking by faith, doesn't like taking what God is offering, he is hoping and he is led to believe that just because that is his status, then the effect of his status in the spirit should become automatic, automatic experience. Without contention, the devil will just become nice and say, oh, we understand you are a new creation now, so we leave you alone. And, and, and. It, it, even when you think about it, it's madness. It's madness to think like that. There is no ground that you possess that is not going to be a result of what you are willing to fight for. God had given the children of Israel the, 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 the promised land, but he told them to begin to contend for it in battle. Why wasn't it automatic? They should not, the guys occupying the place would have just left and said, we heard the Lord is with you and uh, by reason of prophecy, we have been commanded to exit the territory. So we'll leave on Wednesday. <laughs> if you are still with me, say amen. amen. So the first thing that Peter identifies in his great confession is that Jesus is the Christ. He's the administrator of all of the purposes of God. There is nothing in God that you will not need Jesus to enter into because he sits in the seat of administration. The center of uh, the kingdom of God is the administration of God. And the center of the administration of God is that throne that Jesus occupies. Making Jesus the most precious personality in the entire landscape of heaven. Before you can enter into anything whatsoever that has been accomplished in God and wrought by the Spirit, you must come boldly to that throne. Hallelujah. So, Peter was able to pick that up. The second thing that Peter picked about Jesus was that he was the son of the living God. He was, and what that means exactly, in summary, because I don't want to take you on another scripture ride, but just in case you need the reference for that, you may need to study the book of Hebrews chapter 1. And then you read and see all the dynamics that pertains to the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Uh, but this, in summary, though, what, it, what that statement means is that Jesus is the highest definition of the person of God. The highest definition of the person of God. So if you want to know how God operates, how God thinks, God's opinion, God's ways, God's emphasis, you just study the life of Jesus, study the words of Jesus, and uh, you will understand the psychology of God. Now, for your information, part of the burden that I have received from the Lord is a burden to teach us the teachings of Jesus. That's, I'm working on that project right now. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a PhD thesis. I'm researching, you know, to know every single thing Jesus ever said from the original Greek language so that I will not be telling you what English language made us believe, but what is rooted in the original language that was used with all his beauty and his, his, his dexterity. So we will look at the mind of God through the utterances of Jesus because Jesus said that he, he, the words that he spoke were not his. They belonged to his father. They came directly from his father. He's a mere conduit. He's a mere theater uh, through which his father had the opportunity to display himself. So we need to look at the words of Jesus. And it's a vast, vast, vast island. And I trust that God will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, having said all of this, Jesus now brought something. It, the, the, the interaction was becoming glorious from this point. He said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the son of the living God. The thing was becoming sweet. And he said, blessed are thou, Simon Bajuna. 
for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say, he changed his name. He said, thou art Peter. And upon this revelation that you have brought, I will build my church. I thought the thing would end there. You know, I did something again. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are a few metaphors that are used in the Bible that I will need to acquaint us with uh, before we begin this journey this morning. If I notice you are becoming tired, I will stop talking, okay? Part of the, <laughs> uh, the first uh, metaphor, I know you know that, is window. When in the book of Malachi chapter 3, when the Bible says that we should bring in all the tithes so that there will be meat in God's house and that we should prove him now on the basis of our titan, if he will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. So when you see the metaphor window, it is consistent with blessing. Windows. Say window, we're talking about blessing. So, but we, we don't have time to go into all of that now. When you see the metaphor door, you will hear Peter say, uh, Paul says, a great door and an effectual is open unto us, but there are many adversaries. Door, that metaphor as so used, means opportunities. A great opportunity has opened up unto us, but there are many adversaries. So if you are going to have, if a door opens in the spirit, Satan is going to know. If a season opens up for you in the spirit, get ready for warfare. And then the third metaphor that I'd like you to be acquainted with is the metaphor gate. Gate. And this metaphor, I will need to explain what it means from a government in the Old Testament regime. There was a kind of governmental system that God set up for Israel. And the way it works is this. Um, okay, let me, say, let me use Thief culture for instance. What do you call the eldest male person in a clan, in Tivlan? Oh, yeah? All right, so imagine that we have, do you know how many clans you have in, uh, in Jatuaka? How many clans do you have there? Seven clans. So those seven, oh, yeah, from the clans, according to Israel, in the culture of Israel, it is at the gate of the city those people meet to take decisions. Right? So anything they decide at that place becomes binding on the people that live within that city. That's the strongest platform of government. That is what, that is what we call our own senate, our own house of assembly. That's the idea of the house of assembly. So when you see gates there, don't think of entrance. The metaphor means authorities. And if we follow our sister's definition, what was her definition again? That authority is what? Exercising power over something, exercising power over someone. And we are saying that witchcraft is illegitimate authority. So Jesus said, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the church of Jesus. It means that there's going to be a consistent conflict between the authorities of hell. The authorities of hell will be seeking to exert illegitimate authority on the church at, in every age. I, I've not even come to your family yet. We're, we're talking about church first. Because many of us do not believe that um, the church can be bewitched. <laughs> Most of what we call church in Nigeria is a creation of witchcraft. Most of it. And like I showed you in the book of Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, just in case someone is in contention with me concerning the possibility of the church being bewitched, Galatians 3 verse 1 will come to the rescue. This is Paul speaking. He said, oh foolish Galatians, 
who had bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? In the eyes of Paul, he was saying, the only reason why you did not believe this truth is because you were bewitched. Showing that it is possible for an entire congregation to be bewitched and Satan is the one in charge. He wants to assert his authority so that everything will go according to his pre prescription. He wants to assert his authority so that everything in your life will be according to what he desires. He wants to assert, assert his authority so that he, you will think you are praising God, but <laughs> he is the one in charge that determines what happens, that determines who dies, that determines who lives, that determines how far you can go. And God is, in that situation, God, even though we know God is ultimate, the, what is responsible on ground has nothing to do with God's will. It's totally inconsistent with the will of God. So the devil invests a lot in witchcraft because that's how he can ensure that God's will will never be performed because witchcraft gives him the opportunity to be the one whose will is done. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail. How I wish I had more time to talk about the Hades Hades. Hades wants to rule. Hades wants to dominate. I think, let me take five minutes and, and tell you the meaning of the gates of Hades. The authorities of Hades. All right, come with me quickly. I'll just do something now and then uh, we will see uh, how far we can go. Hallelujah. I think that's um, the book of uh, Genesis, chapter number 28, I believe. All right, so Genesis chapter 28, I want to show you the architecture. There's an architecture here uh, that you need to be able to visualize in your mind that will give you the kind of perspective that you need. Because this issue of control, this issue of dominion, this issue... <laughs> As we study it, you'll find out if we use seven indicators in the Nigerian society, you'll find out that we are bewitched in this our current condition. Witchcraft, the stranglehold of witchcraft is what has made us what we are. I worked in the oil industry for 16 years. I know the statistics. I know how wealthy we are in terms of gas. The gas that Nigeria has, we, are, we have little oil and plenty gas. The oil we are talking about is little compared to the gas. It's not little in size, though. It's big, but compared to the gas, it is little. And the gas that we have in Nigeria can heat the whole of Europe. You know, if you go to London now, the first time I went there, I went there in March. <laughs> and uh, I dressed like this. I, you know. And people were looking at me, but I didn't know. I thought it was because I was handsome. That was why they were looking at me. But I didn't know that uh, <laughs> they were saying this man was not properly briefed about the circumstances in this place. So when I, I, I moved my bag, I moved my bag, and I came out, how many seconds I would have died? <laughs> Meanwhile, I was wearing one jacket, one fine jacket that I got from Brazil, so fine, it was like a singlet there. I was not properly advised. I ran into the terminal again, and somebody then gave me a coat. I wore that coat till I came back. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So let's take a scripture quickly. Genesis chapter 28 um, from verse number 12. I just want to illustrate something about the gate of Hades. How is it that Hades, Hades now has authorities that want to influence the church? And if they want to influence the church, it means it is easier to influence governments. It's easier to influence families. It's e easier to influence individuals. Because the only resistance that Satan has is the high tower of Zion, which happens to be the church. And Hades has already adopted the church as a foe that he will contend with all his resources in order for him to gain mastery of control over the church that is in the land. Whenever you find evil things taking place, all kinds of terrible things manifesting first first um, 
diagnosis of that situation is that the church has been captured by witchcraft. The church in that territory has been captured by witchcraft. And what, what they do as church is what Satan allows that is not offensive to his kingdom. And that is why Satan has such leverage, such access, such influence in those lands. But if the church can begin to operate by pres prescription, you see, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And if the church is built and the church operates according to the revelation of Christ, of Jesus as the Christ and Jesus as the Son of God, the church is going to rise from the ruins. Now, so, but stay with me, stay with me. We will build gradually so that you will see the connection. You will see how it is. And then you will understand how God how, how cities heal, how nations heal, and how God takes over. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, this is the story of Jacob, and I know you know the story so well, so we'll just um, read a little in order to establish legitimacy before I begin to explain. Verse 12 of Genesis chapter 28, the Bible says, And he dreamed... And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and the top of it to reach heaven. And behold, angels of God, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. That's my verse of interest. And I need to spend some time to unravel this verse. This was the situation. This guy was running from home, came to a place. It was an open, vast land. He took some stones, made it his pillow, and then he slept in the open field. When he slept in the open field, God visited him in the night, and what God did was that God, uh, since his physical senses had shut down, God activated his spiritual senses for him to see the same location where he was spending the night. He saw infrastructure in the location, first of which was a ladder. A ladder that was set up in the earth, and the tip of the ladder entered into the heavens. Are you with me? Now, let me give you an insight into what was taking place. The guy didn't know that his grandfather had visited that location before. His grandfather had set up an altar in that place. And unfortunately, unfortunately for him, from which perspective you are looking at it, it was one of the stones that the grandfather used to set up his altar that the guy used for pillow. So he became a victim of the transactions of the altar. He was given an access to see what the altar created. And the altar had created a ladder. And the ladder was a connection between earth and heaven. The altar had secured a potter. From that potter, Jesus could stand and be given his decrees. The altar had also generated an oscillatory motion of angels. Because the Bible didn't say they were descending and ascending. The Bible said what? They were ascending and descending. So what was responsible for the os oscillatory motion was on earth. Not in heaven. Is that clear? Now, so my argument in this in raising this scripture, is that the orientation of this ladder, that is not the only orientation, the only possible orientation that that ladder can have. In this case study, the ladder is on the earth and is linked to the heaven because the altar that generated the whole civilization and created the whole spirit city was an altar that was a righteous altar. So its headquarters is in heaven. So the ladder is connecting heaven. So that altar was what created the civilization, created the ladder, created the portal, created access. So heaven and earth began to interact on the basis of the altar that Abraham had created. But unfortunately, not every altar is like the altar of Abraham. The one in your father's house uh, connects the underworld, Hades. You are not with me. I'm trying to explain the gate of Hades shall not prevail. Now, so when you set up another altar and it's a demonic altar and you know what I'm talking about. What it does is that there is another ladder too. There's a linkage between the earth and the underworld. See, the geography of the universe, I don't need to take you to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 to give you the geography of the universe. And it's only Paul that saw the entire universe. I don't have no time. But in the geography of the universe, earth, heaven, is above. Now, be careful, be careful. The above that I'm talking about is 
not necessarily geographically above within the context of this is above. It's not geographical above. But the Bible says heaven is above. The Bible also says that the, earth, the hell is beneath. And it may not necessarily be like this. It may, it may not, but it is beneath. Exactly. And then the earth is in the middle. That's how the universe is. I don't have time to take you there, but I will have time when I want to tell you about heaven and hell. Because we'll spend about 14 days talking about heaven. We will do the biblical ones, and then I will tell you my own personal encounter. I will tell you about hell from scripture. You will not believe what will come out of this Bible. Then I'll also show you how to go to hell. That's, I won't tell you how to go to heaven. I'll just show you this. <laughs> this, is the, this is the way. <laughs> if you are still with me, say amen. amen. So if we have a demonic altar here, the ladder is going to be facing downward and it's going to bring the authorities of Hades. So the devil is going to invest a lot in altars. And when we say altars, what we mean is the alt altar, an altar is a metaphor that means sacrifice. Because the world of the spirit understands the language of sacrifice. If you still remember how Jesus procured our salvation, he came to die. Are you with me? Because that's the language of the immortal realm. I know you drove a jeep here. Spirits are not concerned with what you drove. It's only men that may see you and say, ah, Lafia Zaki, Lafia Zaki. Spirits, in fact, they are offended. If you are, you are even offended that you are, you are. <laughs> they don't, that's not their frame of reference. That's not life for them. Sacrifice is currency in the realm of spirit. And so your salvation was procured because the Son of God decided to become the Son of Man so that through his death, sons of men might become sons of God. That is the story of the gospel. The summary of the gospel. The sacrifice. The realm of the spirit can understand. And that's why if you say you want to walk with demons, want to, walk, want to be a witch, be, be informed. As you grow, your sleep will be reducing because most meetings are in the night. Spirits are more active in the night. Demon spirits are more active in the night than in the daytime. So you are going to be active in the night. Sometimes they'll release you 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and you'll do that for as long as you are a witch. And the more they promote you, after major meetings, general meetings, they will have other meetings, then they, the ones in your village, the people to settle this, and if you have rank, you have to be there in all of the places. So you see him in the morning, like a drunk man. It's because he has not slept. Even he himself doesn't like it, but he can't go. He can't go. If he wants to leave, he has to remain there. Are you with me? The spirit realm runs with the fuel of sacrifice. So when we say altar, you are called to preach the gospel. What we don't tell people is that it will cost you everything. And if you have come to the level, the privileged level that people like us, like me, is walking in, you can't even desire you are bound. You are bound by the Holy Ghost. Someone can give you a gift now. And he said, in fact, so that you will be sure, he will tell you, someone is coming to give you two million on Wednesday. This is, you will send one million to that widow. Then you send the other one million here. And he is not concerned whether there is nothing left. <laughs> you won't, uh, no, there's no <laughs> the money is spent on arrival the sacrifice that's the language that's the language of the realm that's the language of the realm it will make you give everything the things you keep are the ones it led people to give you so you can't even go to a boutique and say you want to buy clothes the clothes you will wear are the ones people make for you. People give. <laughs> it's the sacrifice. And the higher you go, 
when he begins to apportion more territories, that your anointing can operate here, can operate there, the more they sacrifice. If you have not come to a point where you have gone beyond fornication, or not, you can't even have this level I am is, um, is level 14. The anointing has changed 14 times in my life. If you won't even enter level 3, if you have not dealt with those small things, then you will purge your appetite of money. Because money can, is an object of worship. Mammon passing through money can, can damn your soul. So he will take time to deal with you on those matters. What I'm saying is this. You know why it is sweet? The only reason why it is sweet is because the Holy Ghost is in it. Without the Holy Ghost, you, I hope you know, just like God now telling Abraham to go sacrifice his son. That's unnatural obedience. You will not do that. The only reason why he could do that was because the power of the Holy Spirit was upon him. He, he had the enablement by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that Jesus did not offer himself by himself. That offering you see of him on the cross, the Bible says he offered himself by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has so saturated him it, it, and given him a different psychology. That was why it was possible for him to operate like that. That's unnatural obedience. The Holy Spirit will teach you sacrifice. Oh, you want to sleep with all the women and you want to be big. You will wallow under the affliction that has kept your family down all the, all the years. Your ancestors, you will look like them. Because at the age of 50, they end up drunks. So when you see the kind of sin they seen, you will end up like that. You, your own, at 45, you will be there. This is where we end up here in this family. Someone can go to Scotland to study at 50, he will join us in this fellowship. The fellowship of beer drinkers, of drunken people. It doesn't matter how much potential that is in the people. But because he has limited himself to the mundane realm, the power of Hades subdues him. Are you with me? He will, he will purge you from anything that can become a handle of control from the kingdom of darkness. He will purge you from it. That's when he begins to anoint you. Because the moment he starts anointing you, you attract the world. And if you are attracting the world and you have not dealt with you, you will not be a servant of God. You know how many years it took him to purge out greed? Oh, for your information, no man, no, every man born again eh, is a work, is a project for the Holy Spirit. He will, he will put his filter on your lust and he will suck it out. Mm. It will take him like three years to do it. When you see a woman, you don't see anything. Then your greed, he will use that filter, he will put it there. Boom. He knows, he, he knows how to deal with human beings. His hand is ancient. He, he is skillful. He will, he will purge out. He will deflate <laughs> that greed. <laughs> May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. So the language here is sacrifice and it was a sacrifice that was in Abraham's altar that created all of the infrastructure that his grandson came to see so that wizard that is in your family is, is, is taking advantage of the potential of sacrifice and that's the reason why they are polygamists because once in a while they will need to pick one of the children and sacrifice. And it's the one that has the greatest potential, the greatest possibility, has value in the demonic realm. So they spill the blood of that individual. Everything is rooted in a protocol of wickedness and, and deep, deep darkness. And through that, demons are empowered. Influence comes from the kingdom of darkness. The devil sets up a throne and he causes somebody to sit on it. So when we talk about the issue of witchcraft, you have to be careful so that we can understand it very well. Because Jesus, when he unveiled the church, the secret that was upon the heart of Jesus 
was the church. And he could not speak about the church until they had come to Caesarea, where there were physical buildings going on. And then he also said, just like Philip the Tetrarch is constructing things, I'm also a civil engineer, but I am constructing a spiritual building. It is called the church. So you get the idea now. All right, so now that you have seen that the orientation of that ladder can be either connecting earth and heaven, we are the one that has the priesthood to bring heaven to the earth, and the other people that run demonic altars can bring Hades, the authorities of Hades, to the earth. And this is the parable of the contention that will perpetually remain upon the face of the earth as long as the kingdom of God seeks to extend these frontiers, we are going to be pushing against the authorities of Hades. Are you still with me? You want the purpose of God in your family to prosper, you are going to push against the authorities of Hades. It is never automatic. There is nothing that God gives you that is ever automatic. Lazy believers quote, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, just because he wants to be, he wants to believe that he is accurate expecting that the impact of his positional salvation will just happen naturally, normally. You, you know what? We have studied the Bible extensively, and I can tell you we have gained mastery in Scripture. I need to tell you that. And I'm not boasting. It is true. And I also need to tell you that we have worked with Jesus closely and un, in unbroken fellowship for many decades. I can tell you that there's nothing in God that is automatic. Even the anointing you are supposed to carry, it comes in layers. Heaven will trust you with a little portion. And that portion will give you certain kinds of ability. When you pass the test of holding that anointing on your life and still behaving according as God intends, he will give you another. There's a lot of sacrifice even in laying hand on your own ordination in God. So you can imagine. The church in the northeast that my brother spoke about, they pray for five minutes. How did they become that? That was not how they planted those churches those days. How did they become? The gate of Hades. <laughs> the gate of what? Of Hades. Oh, many of you are not aware before we built this place. And this is a project of faith. We didn't have any money. It's just the great one spoke. That we should go to site. That's how we went to site with five million naira. Are you with me? When the building started, the workers came. You know, the drainage was, this drainage broke and it's flooding the land. So we said, okay, we should build it because we are going to wait for the government to build it. We we'll wait, Jesus will come and rapture will take place and the thing will not be built. So we decided to build it. When we costed it, it was like 8.6 million. And we paid the price to build it. So the worker said that we, 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 they were going to break the floor first and they were going to rewire the floor before we cast it back. So while they were breaking the floor, they now noticed that there was a python under. And they, we came to site and there was no work. I said, where are the people that are supposed to be? They, they didn't go. They were there. I said, this, this, the part of the work now is for pastor. What is the problem? There's a snake under. And in their own estimation, they believe that that snake was used to set up the market. That this one now is pastor's work. It's not laborer's work. I'm not telling you a story ahead. I'm telling you practical issues on ground. The gate of Hades will meet you. And the reason why the gate of Hades comes is so that it can administer control, power, to control your destiny illegitimately. Because you are a Christian, you have only one Lord, one Master, one Adonai, and your Adonai is Jesus. He's the one that has the right of way to control you, to manipulate you, to instruct you, to command you, to ask you to do this and to do that and to wait. He has that authority because when he paid the price of your salvation, what you are not aware of is that he bought you as part of his property. But he will not take authority over your life until you reasonably yield, recognize his authority and yield, then your journey in the kingdom begins. Your journey under his lordship. 
we have been to, we went to Ghana. And then we went to where the salt water and the fresh water met. And any time I want to fight spiritually, what happens is that God kindles a fire in the middle of my head here. I begin to feel heat as if a fire is burning. It means it's time to fight. So uh, it was a resort. We had finished preaching. And our brethren in Ghana felt we should rest for two days and very expensive place. And they brought us there. There was a beach. You could run on the beach. You could take a um, water bicycle. And we just landed so fine. I wanted to just go and sleep. And then I felt that fire. I said, Jesus, nobody's fighting here. This is a peaceful place. There's no trouble. Demons are not here. Oh my God. The fire was burning on my head. And it burned for six hours. It means Jesus was saying, if you don't fight, the fire burns. So I now stepped out. I went to the beach and I began to speak in tongues. I began to speak in tongues. Our team now came. We began to speak in tongues. And then the power of God now manifested. People began to fall. On, right, right there on the beach. I think we finished by 10 p.m. I went back. My wife slept instantly. I knew the demons would come back. So I kept watching. You know, have you watched a wrestling fight before? Most of you will go and blow, blow your enemy. Go and say fight has finished. Is that how they finish? <laughs> when you... When you go somewhere and you strike an attack, you know what? Put on your joggers in the night and sit up. Because they will come back. Huh? Eh, so that's how uh, one of our pastors went somewhere and he said, all of you demons, waka. And he went to, to sleep and he, he almost... <laughs> then he called me and said, death is upon me. I said, you don't blow, you don't, you don't, no wrestling fight ends because somebody throws a blow. That one you felt is that he has hammered your... That's hammer lock. You know when you blow like this? There's a move called hammer lock. That's the one that takes your oxygen. Demons are sucking oxygen from your lungs. So I sat up and I waited. And I saw creatures with two heads. And the angel of the Lord didn't allow them to enter our room. But they were walking on the pavement. And they walked there from 12 midnight to 3 a.m. Wicked. Looking for one occasion. If you have seen what I've seen, you will not play with a woman's breast. Oh. Oh. Go home and call your wife and say, see, we are, on, we are in love. <laughs> if you know what I've seen, cultivate the love and, and be her friend. It's so that if you need to touch one, touch her own. But that, that's the only one you can touch. Wicked devils. They will walk till 3 a.m. I was looking at them because I have sight. I have sight in the spirit. Praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. 3 a.m. And I left. Meanwhile, while they were walking there, you know when somebody is dreaming, do you know how they behave? Huh? Okay, some of you know. So while they were walking there, that was how my wife was behaving. Because when demons come close to you, they can transmit visions to you. Just like when angels come close, they can transmit visions. Now, you will need to stay close to Jesus long enough for you to be able to tell what dream came from God or what dream came from devils. I am part of the struggle. I know what spiritual warfare is territorially. Not just casting out demons from people. I know how, what demons hold on to in the territory. And I have been sent by Jesus on those kind of strange missions to dislodge things in territories that demons hold as a legality to operate in those places. These spirits I'm telling you about are exceedingly wicked entities. Second night of crusade in Cameroon, I came back because my room is overlooking the ocean. And they said, this, we got this room for you so that you can be seeing the ocean. In the daytime, it's very fine. But we finished the crusade and came out. I knew that we'd come, so I waited. Waited in the night. Began to speak in tongues. And indeed, they came. They suspended. That is, they jumped out of the water and they were suspended. Suspended like this. This, the water, this. They were suspended like that. Suspended for two hours. 
Then I saw an angel. The angel just dropped his sword. It's bigger than this building. If you turn this building like this, eh? he dropped the sword like that. The sword was like a lamp. It was there till 3 a.m. That's why they couldn't touch land. That means they were saying, if you give us one chance, we'll s- they won't find his body. <laughs> and my security is, my, is in my walk of righteousness. As long as I'm in alignment and I have not exercised any appetite to do anything contrary to God's will, I'm invincible. My security cannot be breached. He said the gates of hell will not prevail. Not that they will not attempt. They guarantee an insurance po- policy. They will not. What? Can we go further? So let me introduce my scripture for the morning. I'll just introduce it briefly, then I'll stop. I'll continue on Sunday night. Just introduce it briefly. It's actually, the scripture I was given is um, Psalms 24. I'll just read it. Then on Sunday night, we're going to do justice to it. Uh, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and there that dwell therein for he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that had clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. If you read NIV, it's the best rendering of that scripture. It's, O God of Jacob. O God of Jacob. Then, verse 7. We'll look at this on Sunday night. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. I don't want to explain too much, but I will explain a little. The reason why this scripture began with the earth is the Lord's fullness thereof. The world and them that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the floors and establishes upon the seas. is because in the nations the authorities of hell have pitched themselves in different lands. Even in your compound. There's a land dispute. and That was the reason why they had to establish the legitimacy of God's claim to the earth. Because authorities have asserted themselves in different places. Exerting control over the territory, the government, over the lives of men. I will show you what God wants us to do. Witches, wizards, warlocks, men that understand how to wield demonic power. I've partnered with the authorities of Hades to keep men, to keep nations under lock and key. So the scripture that we just read is an excerpt of a strange contention. And I will show you what gives birth to the victor's song. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. So when, when, when we're going to do some analysis so that you will know why the spirits felt the land belonged to them. Why the darkness felt the territory was theirs. That they will manipulate his, his government. They will manipulate his schools. Anyone that goes through their schools will come out a vagabond. You will think that all that goes on there is geography, medicine, chemistry, physics, biology, sociology, and psychology. You are not aware that underneath 
at gates, authorities. So the person thinks he's going for psychology. But in 300 level, he will encounter a gate. He might eventually come out with the psychology certificate, but the mark of the beast is upon, upon his life. And control of that life has already been established. So even if he becomes minister of finance, Satan will have his way in his life. He will have a harvest from his, his rising. Satan will leave no stone unturned and any land that is free from his oppression is a land that priests have emerged that are willing to contend if you sleep. He will come into your family and pick somebody. If you sleep again, you pick the second one. Until he dance on you that it is when you arise in the spirit that God can use you to make this decree. Lift up your heads. Oh, he gets... There are some nations it is almost impossible for you to pierce with the gospel. Systems have been set up to ensure that Jesus never rises. That's what happens when the gate of Hades is allowed to bring a civilization. Darkness will be institutionalized. But the prayer for this morning is on this wise. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And be thou lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory. He shall come in. We need the King to come into our politics. We need righteous rulers to sit on the throne so that the land will begin to take the shape of his original ordination as captured in prophecy. We need people that Jesus has conquered to sit as ministers of the republic, bringing perspective from the bowels of the wisdom of God. Then you will see that our land is not cursed. I told you I worked in the oil industry. I know how wealthy we are in, at least from the, the perspective of that industry. The God that created our nation never desired that any man would be poor. But we are in this state because of witchcraft, because of manipulation. Can you cry as we pray today? Lift up your head so you can. You may wish to rise on your feet. Oh, ye gates, lift up your head, ye ancient doors. For the King of glory is the Lift up your heads, oh ye gates. Lift up your heads, ye ancient doors. For the King of glory leads his army on. Lift up your heads, oh ye gates. Lift up your heads, ye ancient doors. For the King of glory leads his army on. And I ane, 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 alleluia. Ane, 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 alleluia. Sing it, alleluia. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church is the only hope that the earth has in wading off the impact and the intention of Hades. Hades wants to master our realm through its authorities. Jesus gives us an assurance. 
He said, the gates of Hades shall not prevail. It means you are the answer for your family. We are the answer for Benue State. We are the answer for Nigeria. It is in the hands of the church. And if we can rise, we will give off a light that darkness cannot comprehend. Can you strengthen yourself in a moment of time in the spirit? Can you strengthen yourself in the spirit? Can you strengthen yourself in the spirit in a moment? And any unrighteousness that you have seen in your family, occasioned by the devil, by the wicked one, you can rebel against it. We are the answer. Until we rise, Satan will rule. He wants to master your life. He wants to master your family. He wants to master the territory. He wants to be in charge. He wants to control our affairs. But Jesus said, the gate of Hades, it shall not prevail. Cecila embrace Kofalama Natatala Yale Korea Sika Brentomo Honseli Endo Menia Siko Branta Baboli Bacadela Yanto Labora Niscabre Racopeta Bacuta Balatala Masaiko Prescova Latella Ico Brendo Mosquita Bellia a saucy lato, a cabento cellar, a cabalataya, a casusale, a cabranta bacuria, a becusa tabalato in Acadia, a breast coffee lamina categole, a brighta compelasca, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's why the Lord is raising you, He's raising you to stop the contention to be the functionary that will stop the advancement of the reign of darkness the devil intends to exert his power his influence but it is illegitimate you are God's answer to the situation Siko manteli monde, reko samakaya bora basia, mantebo akabola, ya kasabala tele, ya kompresta buka bela batwa, akabarata banta la baboria, sheni kompeta la kosi, abres kobela tele, akabanta babota tala, akasabala ite. Iyako patwa hiko salaba Lateke kababa babaya Iso se salabona Akabe sopo Akaba salabo Akaba kulabo Akaba sandabo Lateke balatabo Abranda babo lebabo Ayaka balada balayat Iko sama La sopria Abelantome Asamenante Ruka bababa Iyaka besoba Alatwa Abama Sakabala Ah Bosa Kubela Benaita Rake Bosa Kainde Abres Koba Koba Latwa Abranda Babo Kobe Aseliata Abranda Babo Da Alata Tata Raka Balala Babo Ramena Saka Ramena Kompala Abrakaya Sote Labros Kaba, Rakaba Taba, Rakaba Bosade, Abraita Kabela, Abu Saba, Abalabata Mantalaba Borea, Abalata Branda Bayeko Samena, 
Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads. Oh, ye gates. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads. And be thou lifted up. Ye everlasting Lord. Rabba <laughs> Rakabalata <laughs> Es I was only able to establish the introduction of the message. I was supposed to show you tributaries through which the illegitimate authority of Satan passes through to exert itself over individuals, over families, over nations, over continents. It's a cosmic war. And Jesus told us from the beginning the gates of Hades who make an attempt seizing control of your life, seizing control of your destiny, allowing you to dance according to his own drum beats and to pledge your allegiance to his flag. Only such whose lives are founded upon the revelation of Jesus can break free from his hold. As we continue with the lecture, you will see more deeply the issues of which I speak. But if you're already here in this meeting or under the sound of my voice, any time whatsoever you listen to this piece, it is because God has conscripted you to take responsibility. So I want to start from a basic context. Your family. I want to give you a declaration that you need to do every morning. Lift up your heads. O ye gates. During the course of the privileges that God made available to me in ministry, I've traveled a little. And then you are invited to preach in a certain nation and you just begin to pray and your prayer is just hitting as if there's a rock but people that know the way of prayer know that that thing you are feeling your prayer bouncing back can only last for two hours three hours can't survive seven can't survive eight so if you want to command gates to open it's not just to wake up with your brush and your toothpaste and say Lift up your heads. Oh, you. Even you will not hear yourself. Talk more of devils. Respond. It will take long prayers. I went to London and I was praying. And the thing was bouncing back and it bounced back for six hours. I said, I know this trick. Inconsistency lies the power. It was when I started entering like eight hours that the atmosphere began to open up. So I pushed it from 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so that it is not reversible. 
as long as I'm in that environment, I can command deliverances to Jacob. And when I came to the pulpit, I found out this is experience, okay? This is not the Bible, this is experience. That London is darker in darkness than your village. There's no place I went in Benue State that it took me up to 12 hours to open. No. The gates lifted. Three hours, four hours it will open. So I've come in the name of the Lord. I will show you how princes operate. Sons, the burden of sons is the nations. Have you seen that scripture? He said, ask and I will give you the nations. It is prayer. This thing we're talking about lifting up your heads. It's a prayer that opens up the territory. It refuses the reign of darkness and allows a passage. But it's not the prayer of children. It will take staying power. Staying power. Staying power. Staying power. In Cameroon, I was doing seven hours before I come to the field every day. Even though there was morning session. So I wake up very early. Put in some hours. Put in before I come out. When I come out, I see there's electric on my body. <laughs> I know that if, if anything that tries, I will kill it. That is, it will go down. And Satan came upon one lady and began to speak through her. Then you could see the bitterness. He, 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 he wanted my neck. He want, but he's not giving on to him. Seven hours. Not because it took by two hours the thing had opened, but I stayed for additional five to ensure that anything we do will not be reversed in a hurry. And I told them, now that I'm leaving, that's when the miracles, the real miracles will start. Somebody went from the crusade, they went home crippled because he was not healed. About five people, crippled people walked. Some others went home. One went and slept and woke up walking. I said, as I'm leaving, then it will begin, strange things will begin to take place. Sicknesses, they slept. When they woke up, he left. And then the ultimate one was when we left, mad woman with rags, her mind came back. The thing that was on the territory that was bringing madness, bringing that thing was defeated. And a new wind, a new civilization began to enter into the territory. Very soon we will have to go back. And the one that wants to germinate again will say, Ah, <laughs> lift up your heads, O ye gaze. And be thou lifted up your everlasting Do you know what you want to pray for? That God will give you capacity for long prayers. You want to see changes? <laughs> you need to travel. <laughs> long. So we'll do an exercise tomorrow. We'll start. How do you do it? 12 o'clock. And then we'll, from that 12, into the service. And then you will see the things that will break. Exercise yourself. When we open up, meanwhile, we are going to open some places for prayer. If you, you can drive in from the office anytime. This, this house is a house of prayer. We we'll equip places. Equip them. It will be conducive so that you can. That's what it is about. You want to cause the gates to be lifted? Oh my. You need to know the language of long prayers. Long, long, seven, seven. You press it, you press it, you press it. The thing will just open. You see, like a curtain to, to open. Oh, you want to see miracles? Go for 12 hours, for three days, before you come to the pulpit. But eat a little before you come to the pulpit. If not, you will fall there. <laughs> you, will fall, you will fall on the ground. They, then the prayer point will not change. You will not become the. <laughs> we are going to see, okay, we are going to see power on the field like never before this year. Amen. Oh, we say, oh, Medugri is so difficult. Not is. You see, if power, you know what they call power, if it comes for four days, people will rethink their faith. They will rethink it. And I trust God because we are going to be climbing into the north. 
They place people. Uh, somebody called me from one city in the north. I said, pastors are living here now. We are climbing there. We are climbing. We are climbing. If you cannot pray, live there. Live there. If you, can, if you are in the north and you can't pray, live there. Come. Come. Move down. Go to Boko. And let men of prayer go into those territories. You, it will open up. There's no land that strong. Can we ask that God will give us the capacity for long prayers? Staying power. Staying power. Staying power. Staying power. In La Soseli Kabila Talia. Staying power. And the dynamite in your spirit will break loose. The power that is in your spirit will rise up. Same power. 